Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Pastor Michael Jackson. Welcome to the Wednesday night Cutting It Right Bible Study. Once again, here with a Bible study that we pray will be riveting. Uh, a Bible study that you can uh, definitely say that you learned something. A Bible study that you can say that uh, touched your soul, uh, not just your mind. A good Bible study is one that will not only make you think, but it will give you something to apply to your life. And so that's what we're here. That's what we do. And we praise the Lord for allowing us the opportunity. Uh, we are streaming right now live on Facebook. We're streaming live on YouTube and live on Spreaker. Dot com. That is our podcast platform. We thank you uh, for all of those who do uh, listen in and download uh, this particular podcast and many of uh, our other uh, podcasts. I thank you for uh, downloading uh, our podcast. Uh, once again, we come to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who is able. He alone is able to bring healing. Uh, he alone is able uh, to bring deliverance to your life. And he, of course, can bring salvation to your life so if you know anyone who is in need of any of those things uh tell them right now to tune in to the cutting and right bible study uh you will hear you will hear the truth here and you will hear a word that will uh, that will hopefully touch your heart and touch your mind and touch your spirit uh and cause you to walk with the lord in a in a greater way amen you can also go over to our website located at that's the word dot org and you'll also go over to YouTube uh, and uh, also visit our YouTube channel and while you're there you can subscribe to our channel amen we're going to pray we're going to go right into our study amen Lord we bless you we thank you once again for allowing us to be in your presence and we pray Lord for the next few minutes Lord that you might be with us open up your word to us Lord that we might be able to see and even comprehend the great riches that are contained uh, in your word Lord open up our hearts to receive Bless those who will be listening. Bless those those who will be watching. And Lord, I pray that you might also open up their hearts and minds to receive your word tonight. We bless you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We are currently uh, in a study entitled The Absolute, The Absolute Power of the Cross, The Blessings. The Absolute Power of the Cross, The Blessings. The Blessings of the Cross and the Blessings of the Cross are are many but we've been focusing we've been focusing on the book of Ephesians uh, chapter number one uh, starting in verse number three uh, going all the way down to verse number 14 actually starting in verse number one the first 14 verse are chock full of the blessings of the cross and the blessings of the cross equal the power of the cross the absolute power of of the cross, and along the way, we'll st we we've been stopping off and, and making points uh, at certain places uh, that are uh, relevant and pertinent uh, to our own uh, Christian walk. Uh, we started off by talking about uh, last week. We were talking about the fact that in verse number three, <coughs> uh, uh, Ephesians chapter number one, in verse number three, the fact that we are blessed, that we are blessed blessed and you you hear that you hear a phrase uh, much of the time you hear the phrase the phrase that we are blessed and and highly favored and, and this is true but what's the amount of our blessings we said he says in verse number three he says bless me the god and father of of our lord jesus christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessing that's the amount of blessings that we have how many we have all spiritual blessings and notice that these are spiritual blessings uh, entwined within, entwined within the spiritual blessings, uh, you can say, you can talk about your physical blessings and your material blessings and all of the other blessings that might go with it. But every blessing, every blessing comes from the cross. Every single blessing that we have comes from the cross. Listen, when we talk about the cross, we're talking about an event, the event of the cross. The, the cross was the place where Jesus Christ died. He died for a purpose. He was there and he died for our sins. At a place called Calvary or Golgotha. He died there, but the purpose that he was there to die for was so that he could pay the price that was needed to pay for our sins. The only way that our sins could be paid for was by a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. The lamb, the goat, the bull of the Old Testament times were no longer necessary. 
So therefore, we no longer need to abide by Old Testament ways and means. We now have Christ, the perfect Lamb of God who has died for us. And his death means that we are free. His death means that we can now live in victory. His death means that we can no more say that we are in bondage. The Bible says that we don't we uh that we should stand firm. Stand firm in the liberty that Christ has made us free with and that we should be not entangled anymore with this yoke of bondage. In other words, do not go back into uh the law. So the cross was an event. It was actually the greatest event in the history of the world. The cross. I know there's been many events, many different things that have happened in this world. Different wars have, have made change in this world. Uh, uh, different uh, uh, terrible things. Uh, the attack, 9-11, changed the world. It changed the world, how the world sees things and how we do things. It, it was a significant event. And there have been many other uh, significant events in world history. Not just United States history, but world history. But the single most greatest event in the history of mankind is the death of Jesus Christ. You, could, you want to say his life, you want to say his entire life was a turning point, you can say that too. But when he died, something happened. When he died, he paid the price for our sins. We no longer have to live in sin. We no longer have to say there is no hope. We now have a savior, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. So the cross is an event, it's a place, and it's also uh, a process. And we've been talking about that process that we are still undergoing because we are still, we are still living out the blessings. And all the blessings of the cross, we cannot even begin to number the blessings of the cross. We cannot even begin to number them because they are countless. Listen, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the source of all things. Every blessing that we have, Jesus Christ is the source. It's because of Jesus Christ that we are justified. It's because of Jesus Christ that we are sanctified. It's because of Jesus Christ that we will be glorified. It's because of Jesus Christ that we can say that we have his grace upon us. It's because of Jesus Christ. Every single blessing that we enjoy is because of Jesus Christ. And so we need to thank him. Every blessing that received. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse number 6, he says, I am the way. I am the truth. He says, I am the life. He says, no man comes to the Father except through me. Those are the words of Jesus uh, himself. And so we need to pay careful attention to that. Not only is the cross, not only is the cross the source of all blessings, the cross of Christ is the only means, is the only way by which all these things are given to us. It's through the cross. Through the cross. Everything happens because of the cross. Everything. Everything. And we need to pay careful attention to the cross. Now, when we talk about the cross, and you will hear me talk about the cross much, when we talk about the cross, once again, and I don't mind being redundant, I don't mind repeating myself on this because I want to make sure that we understand what we mean when we say the cross. When we say the cross, when we continue to say the cross, I am not speaking of the wooden beam that Jesus Christ died on. No. I'm not talking about that piece of wood. As we, as we enumerated the last time we were together, I mentioned the fact that if someone were to find the actual cross that Jesus died on, it would be of no value whatsoever. If it was authenticated that this is the cross that Jesus died on, it would mean nothing. If you would take a piece of it, it would mean nothing. It's just a piece of wood. So when we mention the cross, we are not talking about a wooden beam. What we are talking about is what happened at the place called Calvary. What happened on that hill called Golgotha. What happened on that Friday afternoon where Jesus died and what transpired there. The after effects. He died for our sins. Our sins were placed upon him. He became sin for us. 
not became a sinner for us. As many in the word of faith movement will tell you. Many in the word of faith movement will tell you that Jesus Christ became a sinner. And we know that this is absolutely false. Uh, many in the word of faith movement will tell you, uh, and many others will tell you, not to even preach the blood. Not to even preach about the cross, because the cross was a place of defeat, not victory. They say that Jesus Christ did not complete his work of redemption on the cross. He completed it in hell. Now we know that this is a lie. This is another one of the doctrines of devils or demons that the Bible speaks about. Jesus Christ did not become a sinner. Jesus Christ did not complete the work of redemption in hell. When he died on the cross, one of the last words that he said was, it is finished. He didn't mean that my life is over when he says it is finished. He meant the work that I came to do is complete. Even up to the last thief on the cross who he took with him to paradise. He said, it is finished. My blood has been shed. The price has been paid. The enemy has been defeated. And it was done. It is finished. And you can read Colossians chapter 2 of verses 15 and 16 to read how that transpired. But the victory happened at the cross. The victory happened at the cross. And the cross of Christ is the only means by which all of these things are given to us. Christ and him crucified must be. Hear this now. Christ and him crucified must be the object or the focus, the center point of our faith. It must be. In other words, you must not place faith someplace else. You cannot place your faith in Christ and something else. In Christ and something else. Not even in things, you don't place your faith in the act of Bible reading. You do not place your faith in the act of fasting. You do not place your faith in the act of reading your Bible. You do not place your faith in these things. Our faith is in Christ and Christ alone. Your faith will only be as strong as the object that it is placed in. And when you leave, let Christ be the centerpiece of your faith. Your faith, your faith can be strong. It will be strong. It will be strong. So we need to remember that. Let's go to real quick as we continue before we continue in the book of Ephesians right here. Uh, Romans chapter 1. Uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. Once again, talking about the cross. Talking about the cross. The absolute power of the cross. Uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. It says, For I am not ashamed, Paul speaks, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is. It is. What is? The gospel. The power. It is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. When you speak about the gospel. You're speaking about Christ. When you're speaking about Christ. You're speaking about him crucified. You want to say Christ raised from the dead? Yes. But here's what Paul said. Paul said he preached Christ crucified. Now, of course, the resurrection is obviously of enormous importance. But once Jesus died, the resurrection was not in question. It was going to happen. It was going to happen because Christ said it was going to happen anyway. But when he died, when he died, something happened. Something happened. That was where the victory was won. That was where our, that was where uh, we find our redemption at the cross. You can also go uh, to the book of First uh, Corinthians, chapter number one. First Corinthians, chapter number one, in verse number seventeen and eighteen. Paul once again speaking. He says, "For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach." The gospel, 
not with wisdom of words, here's what he says now, lest the cross of Christ be of none effect. So he equates the gospel with the cross of Christ. Once again, we said the cross is the gospel. The gospel is the cross. You cannot separate them. He says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. So not only is the gospel, not only is the gospel about the cross, the gospel is the cross. And so if you want to make headway, if you want to make inroads into this thing called salvation, you have to recognize the cross. Any church, any church who refuses or downplays the preaching of the cross, it is no longer a church. It is not a church anymore. No. The, a church must preach Christ and Him crucified. It must preach that. If a church does not major, major in preaching, speaking of, make a point of talking about Christ and Him crucified, then what are they talking about? What is that church talking about? And what is that church doing? Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But what are we what are we doing? Are we preaching the gospel? Or are we preaching our own ideas? Are we preaching politics? Or are we preaching social activism? What are we preaching? We need to preach the gospel, which is the cross of Jesus Christ. When you preach the cross of Jesus Christ, then you can expect you can expect several things when you begin to preach the cross of Jesus Christ. You can, you, you can expect individuals to become saved, truly born again. Number two, you can, you can expect backlash. Backlash from those who are enemies of the cross. And do not believe that the enemies of the cross are just those on the outside looking in. Do not believe that the enemies of the cross are just individuals who are in the world or of the world. Those who are unsaved, do not believe that. The enemies of the cross many times are those who are within the body, who are part of the organized church. These are the main opponents of the cross because they preach something different. They preach a different gospel. They preach another gospel, which is not the cross of Jesus Christ. We must we must major in preaching the cross of Jesus Christ. That's where the power is. That's how people get saved. That's how people come to Christ. It's not just about your testimony. Your testimony is your testimony is a witness to the power of the cross. And so you should not be shy about sharing your testimony, what the Lord has done for you. But what's going to make the difference, what's going to make the difference is the cross of Jesus Christ. Do you preach the cross? Is it about you or is it about Christ? Nothing wrong with your testimony. I have a testimony. You have a testimony. But the reason why I have a testimony is because of what Jesus did for me. The reason I can say what Christ has done for me is because of what he did for me at the cross. And so we must preach the cross once again if a church does not if a church is not actively preaching the cross of Jesus Christ talking about the cross then that church is neglecting its duty that church is doing a disservice to not only the people in that church but that church is doing a disservice to its community if it refuses to recognize the supremacy and the power of of the cross we must recognize the supremacy and power of the cross we don't want to do a disservice to the people uh, that we serve we do not want uh, to do that one more scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse number 2 here's what Paul said concerning the cross of Jesus Christ and the supremacy that the cross had in his own life he says for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified that's what he was about. That's what he did. That's what that's what he had determined that he was going to do. 
That's what he had determined he was going to be. He was going to be all about the cross. I determined not to know anything among you. I don't want to know anything else. I don't want to talk about anything else. He says, except the cross of Jesus Christ. He wanted to make the cross of Christ the focal point. He did, obviously, make the cross of Christ the focal point of his ministry. All of our ministries. The cross, the cross of Jesus Christ should be the focal point of all all of our ministries, no matter what ministry it is, whether it's a small church with not too many ministries, or whether it's a large church uh, with many ministries, the cross of Jesus Christ should be the focal point. Whether it's a homeless ministry, whether it's a bus ministry, uh, whether uh, food uh, uh, food pantry ministry, whatever ministry it is, and listen, there are countless ministries. Uh, larger churches, mega churches have so many ministries, but the focal point has to be Christ and him crucified. How does that happen? What do you mean the focal point has to be Christ and his uh, uh, and the cross no matter what ministry it is? You, the, the goal of your ministry, the goal of your ministry, no matter what it is, is to win people to Christ. The usher's ministry, the focal point should be the cross of Jesus Christ. How so? Once again, it's how you project and how you come across to other people. A new person comes in and you must greet them properly. They must know, they must, they must sense Christ in you. They must sense Christ in you. That smile, you don't know where people are coming from. That smile on your face, your manner, the way you, the way you go about doing uh, 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 your, your, your job. You never know the difference that it's going to make. And then once they are settled in and they hear the word of God, how you treated them when they came in, coupled with the word of God that was spoken from the pulpit, can play an integral part in bringing them to Christ. Once again, the cross of Jesus Christ. If there's a homeless ministry, of course you want those homeless individuals to become part of the body of Christ. It has to go beyond just picking them up and bringing them in, which is good. Now that you have them there, now you need to show them the love of God. The cross of Christ needs to be the focal point of all of our ministries. We, we, we cannot stress this more. It, it's the cross. It's the cross. That's where all of our blessings flow from. So Paul himself said, I determined, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. Amen. So we thank we thank God for the Apostle Paul and we thank God for his dedication. Now, if it was not for the Apostle Paul, uh, many of us, many of us, all of us, if it were not for the Apostle Paul, and I'm not trying to downplay Christ himself, of course Christ himself, but Christ, uh, Christ used the Apostle Paul to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. We are Gentiles because we are not Jews. And so if it were not for Paul being obedient to the heavenly vision, then we would not be here today. I would not be speaking to you. You would not be hearing me. We would not have churches all over that we do now if Paul the Apostle was disobedient to the heavenly vision. So we thank God. We thank God for the man of God. And we thank God for all those who are out there and who are uh, spreading his word uh, the way the Lord wants uh, them to. Uh, Verse number three, verse number three, going back to verse number three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, where in Ephesians chapter one, verse number three, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, all spiritual blessings. Now we talked about the location. The location of these spiritual blessings are in heavenly places, the heavenly places. Once again, it's better to have, it's better to have spiritual blessings in heavenly places than to have earthly blessings in earthly places. Once again, it's good to have that car, it's good to have that house, it's good to have that money in the bank. All of those are things that you may need uh, living in this world. It's good, it's good to have good health. All of these things are, are, are blessings. They are blessings. But once again, the greatest gift that we have are the heavenly blessings. The greatest blessings that we have are the ones which are above. Those cannot be corrupted those cannot be stolen every other every other blessing that i spoke of can be tainted and corrupted and stolen in some kind of way we can lose it 
We can lose our health. We can lose our money. We can lose our house. We can lose our car. We can lose all of these things. We can they, they can be lost. But if you have spiritual blessings that are within and above, you can still live this life. You can still live this life. So we need to make sure that we understand the difference between earthly blessings and heavenly blessings. Our blessings are in heavenly places. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 9 and 10. But he says, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. You may not have much on this earth, but if you're born again, you say, you have all your blessings stored for you, waiting for you in heaven. We, all we have now is we will get into it in the coming weeks. All we, what we have now, what we have now is the down payment. We have the down payment. We have the guarantee that one day we will be there enjoying the spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The down payment that we have, looking ahead to in a few verses, but the down payment is the Holy Spirit in us who has sealed us unto the day of redemption. That's our guarantee. That's our earnest, as it says uh, in the Bible, in the King James Version. It's our earnest. It's our down payment. It's our guarantee that we will one day enjoy those blessings uh, in heaven. Uh, so this type of wealth is, is much more valuable. It says that we have these blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Once again, we talked about the fact that Christ is the source. Verse number four, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Let's break down this verse and talk about exactly what this verse is telling us about our being chosen. You are chosen. I love this verse in First Peter, I believe, or Second Peter. I, my mind, uh, it escapes my mind right now, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You're chosen. Chosen. He chose us. You're born again. He chose you personally. Picked you out. That's what it means. That's what it means to be chosen. It's, it's to be elected. It's to be selected. It's to be picked out. And, and uh, here's, the, here's the great thing about it. There was nothing great about you that caused him to do it. It's by his grace. Once again, we are saved by grace. That's what God gives us that we don't deserve through faith. And so we see the combination of God's grace and our faith brought all this thing together. And we, are, we can now say that we are in Christ. We are in Christ. So he chose us. We, he chose us in him. I want to go to the book of I want to go to the book of John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We're going to go through a series of scripture verses here. We may not move beyond uh verse number 4 tonight, but we are not in a rush. Uh John chapter number 6 and verse number 37. John chapter 6 and verse number 37 speaking about the fact that we are chosen. John 6 and 37 it says all that the father giveth me shall come to me and him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out once again talking about god's sovereignty and man's responsibility god chooses and we come god chooses and we come and he says when we choose to come he will not cast us out. He does not cast us out. If anyone comes to the Lord in sincerity, and God knows the heart, if anyone comes to him in sincerity, he will not cast them out or push them aside. It will not happen. It does not happen. It cannot happen. The Lord will not break his word. 
He says he will in no wise or no way cast them out. We need to be mindful of that. We, he chose us. He chose us first before we ever chose him. That's something important uh, to remember. In verse number 39, just go down to verse number 39. John chapter 6 and verse number 39. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up against that last day. Now these next few verses are going to speak about the fact that when you are saved, once again, there's a lot of controversy, and we're not going to try and win an argument tonight, uh, of course. At any time, we're not trying to win an argument. But there are two sides. There are those who believe that you can lose your salvation, and there are those who believe that you cannot lose your salvation. These verses are obviously stating the fact that you cannot lose your salvation. He says in verse number 39, of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. He is speaking about individuals. He is speaking about the same individuals in verse number 37. Him that shall come to me, I shall in no wise cast out. And he says, all that he gives me, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me, I will lose nothing. I should lose nothing. Now, once again, we see in the case, in the case of Judas, Judas did not belong to Christ. He did not belong to Christ. Christ chose 12 men and Jesus out of his own mouth said, one of you is a devil. He was not saved. He was not born again. He was not a man of God. He was not a believer. He went along. He, he, he saw all the things that Jesus did. He joined in. He was part of the Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 and 25 crowd. That's who Judas was. Lord, in your name, we cast out demons. Lord, in your name, we've done mighty miracles. Lord, in your name, we did all of these. All of these. And Jesus turns around in Matthew 24 and 25 and says, I never knew you. Depart from me. I never knew you. That's where that Judas was in that group that looked, smelled, sounded like, carried on as if he was one. But he was not one. Judas, Judas seemed to be a half but he was a have not and anyone who who comes to Christ who is in Christ cannot i'm going to i'm going to be i'm going to be starting this will not lose their salvation and i know i know there are many who believe otherwise and that's fine that's fine we don't need to we don't need to break fellowship over this this is not something that we need to break fellowship over but one thing that we have to understand, when, when, when you're talking about this, the idea of not losing your salvation, there many say those who say that you can lose your salvation, they are of the devil because they are giving you license to do whatever you want to do. Anyone who is truly born again is not going to believe in that way. And if they do believe in that way, the Holy Spirit will be very quick to put them in line. If you are truly born again, you're not going to say hey well hey I can do whatever I want to do it doesn't matter what I do because I'm saved anyway and I'm not going to lose my salvation so I can sin all I want no that's not that's not the mind of a saved person that's not the heart that's not the spirit of a saved person who is going to say I can't wait to sin because it doesn't matter because I'm already a Christian no that's that's not the Christian mind that's not the Christian mind and so anyone who thinks that way is teetering is teetering on the edge they may not be saved maybe they need more teaching but they may not be saved if you're going around thinking that because you're in Christ and you cannot lose your salvation then you can sin at will never can you sin at will shall we continue in sin that grace may abound Paul said God forbid he said oh no he said of course not no no, so that's a faulty idea that those who believe in uh, eternal security, in other words, the uh, the continuance of the sal of salvation in individuals, uh, it's it's faulty to believe that 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 we believe that it means that we can just sin at will. No, 
you cannot. Let's go over to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, talking about the fact that we are chosen. We are chosen by him. That's the plan. That's the plan. That's the plan that God has chose that we be in him. Acts chapter 13 and verse number 48. Acts chapter 13. Follow me here in verse number 38. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Now hear what that scripture says. It says, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. They were chosen. Ordained, chosen. They were chosen for eternal life. Now, here's what, once again, here's this line of thought that the Bible is, is throughout the Bible. God has chosen some to be saved. Now, if God has chosen some to be saved, does that, order, does, does that mean that the Lord has chosen others uh, to not be saved? It has to mean that. But God, once again, God knows the heart of everyone. God knows what direction everyone is going to go. But yet and still, the word of God goes to them. Everyone has an opportunity. We are told to preach the gospel to everyone, to every creature. We don't know when you speak to someone about Christ, you don't know if, you're ever, if they're ever going to get saved. Your prayer is that they become saved. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so each individual is responsible for his or her, her choice. God is not in heaven causing people not to call upon his name because they're not chosen. Everyone, they are chosen. The only reason that they are they are not chosen, quote, not chosen, is because of his preordained knowledge, foreknowledge. He knows that some will not believe. And so obviously, if they do not believe, it extends to the fact that they were not chosen. But it's not so much God that made that decision. They have already made that decision because the Lord know, knew that they would not. Sounds complicated, but it sounds simple to me. Okay? So, once again, once again, it is the Lord who has chosen us. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. We can go over to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Verse number 9, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 9. It says, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Once again, the foreknowledge of God pre it was already in the mind of God that we would be saved and not just individually but it's the entire plan also let me put it out that way it's the plan also and so we must make sure that we understand that we're chosen by Christ one more scripture in second second Thessalonians second Thessalonians chapter number two and verse number 13 second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 13. It says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, talking about Christians, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Once again, it's the commingling of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. God's action and man's action. Salvation. Salvation. Okay? From the beginning, God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation. <coughs> How? How did he choose? Through sanctification of the Spirit. In other words, 
In other words, by the activity or the 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 work of the Holy Spirit in redemption or conviction, convicting your heart of your sin, and of the of the belief of and belief of the truth. So once the Spirit of God begins to do his work in your heart, once you are convicted of your sin and you realize that you are a sinner, the next step is to believe. That goes to John chapter 3 and, and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. That is the belief, once again. Through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Once again, it's not by works of righteousness that you have done. You are chosen not because of who you are. You are chosen not because of the great things that you have done. Uh, you did not. Uh, uh, you are not chosen because of some great work that you accomplished. No, you are chosen by His grace through your faith. You believed. You were saved. This is how it happens. That's the process. That's the process. And so, once again, it's God's activity. And man's responsibility. They're equally necessary when it comes to salvation. That's how it happens. That's how it happens. Okay? All right. Verse number four. Let's go back to Ephesians uh, chapter uh, number one and verse number four. He's chosen us from before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him. Once again, the time of God's choosing is the time of God's choosing is before the foundation uh, of the world. Okay? That's that's the time of his choosing. But what's the goal? What's the goal of his choosing us? The goal, the goal of Christ choosing us. From the foundation of the world, you you have to you have to cipher that out in your mind. The fact that Christ has called you from the very beginning, from the very beginning, from the foundation of the world. I mean, when you when you begin to think that out in your mind, when you begin to roll that over in your mind, it is astounding when you think about it. Little old you, little old me, that we were in His mind even at the foundation of the world way back before Genesis 1 1 we were in his mind and he was putting this together and you and I were there in his mind in his heart that we were chosen foreordained before the foundation of the world that is amazing amazing the creator of the universe Listen, they have telescopes now, and, and I just I was reading online that, that they have gotten these pictures. They have gotten these pictures from outer space uh, that show the vastness of space, uh, our own Milky Way, and other galaxies uh, so many so many miles away that they don't even call it miles; they call them light years. And we see the God who created all of that had us these few little molecules these few little these few little pieces of flesh that we are and he had us as his prime source man was God's masterpiece and we were in his heart and we were in his mind he chose us from the foundation so the goal of God's choosing is that we should be holy and without blame before him holy and without blame three things holy talking about being set apart set apart sanctified 
that's free from all impurity. Now, what we're about to say, these three things that we're about to mention, uh, which are which are uh, the goal of his calling us, this is our position. Position. And our position never changes. Our position never changes. So number one, we are holy. You are holy. Even as we speak, you're holy. You're holy. The enemy will tell you you're not holy. The enemy will tell you that you're dirty. The enemy will tell you that you're no good. The enemy will tell you all sorts of lies. The devil is a liar. That's what he does. But you are holy. Your position is sanctified. You have been set apart. Number number two, you are without blame. That is, once again, free from all disqualifying blemishes. You are, in the sight of God, your position is spotless. Remember, he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. He's speaking about our position. Position. Your position is not going to change. Your position is not going to fluctuate. Your position is not going to be up one day. Your position is not going to be down another day. Your position is not going to be in tomorrow and, and, and out the next day. That's not your position. Your position is set. Your position is firm. You are in Christ. This is the goal of him calling us. And third, we are before him. We are holy and we are without blame right in front of his eyes. He sees us. He sees us every day. He sees us. He knows us. He knows everything that goes on. Every thought, every action. He sees it all. We are before him naked. He sees it all. But you're holy. You're without blemish. And you're in front of his eyes. Now, once again, Talking about your position. Now, that does not explain your condition. Your condition is your everyday walk with Christ. Your condition is your practical everyday use of the word of God in your life. In your life. Your, your condition has to do with the daily choices you make. To follow him. And on a daily basis. Sometimes you do the right thing. And sometimes you do the wrong thing. There will be occasions. There will be many occasions sometimes. Where you sin. But sinning as a Christian. Does not disqualify you. From being a Christian. I had someone ask me. A few weeks ago. Maybe a few weeks ago. And they were worried because they had done something wrong. God was angry. God was mad. Sure, listen, God is not honored when we sin. He is displeased when we sin. He doesn't want us to sin. But the Holy Spirit is there to bring us back in. The Holy Spirit draws us. He will guide us into the truth. And so we must be mindful that God is not this big ogre in heaven, this big giant judge in heaven with a mallet. And he's saying, Boom, boom, boom. You're bad. You're no good. That's not the Lord. That's not the Lord. The enemy comes and he brings condemnation. The Holy Spirit comes and brings conviction. And he shows you the error of your ways. He shows you that you've wronged. And you, when, you, when he shows you that you've been wrong, you need to respond to it. When he reveals to you that you have sinned, when he reveals to you that you have come short of his glory, then you need to respond positively. In other words, come to him when he calls, when he draws you, come. Do not continue to push the Lord away. Do not be rebellious and say, I'm okay when you're not. All of these things are not pleasing to God, but they do not disqualify you from being a Christian. Once again, and we'll get more into it next time we get together. You are sealed. You are sealed. Sealed. And that means a lot when we talk about being sealed. So as God sees you, as a Christian, as God sees you, 
He sees your position. And yes, he sees your condition too. Once again, don't get me wrong. He sees when we do wrong. And he deals with us on an individual basis when we sin. 1 John 1 9 says that you're going to sin. And so he has made, the Lord has made provision for us uh, when we sin. Not if we sin. The Lord has made provision for us when we sin. 1 John uh, chapter 1 and verse uh, number 9. 1 John chapter 1 number 9. Verse number 9. If we confess our sins, which shines forth the fact that you are going to have sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just or righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he, he, he has made provision to, to bring forgiveness when we do sin. You are going to sin. But how the Lord sees us, he does not see our sin when it's talking about our condition, our, our position. Because our position is Christ's position. We are in him. And when the Lord, when God sees his son, he sees no sin. And when he sees us in him, he sees no sin. Positionally. Positionally. Okay? So he sees us in Christ and therefore he sees us as absolutely pure and blameless. Blameless. Now next time we come together, we're going to go into, uh, we're going to go into verse number five of this, the absolute power of the cross. I know we've said many things many things in this session uh, that maybe your mind has to get a chance to really go through, but take the time. Go through these verses. Listen again. Uh, go to Spreaker.com and you can hear these words all over again. Uh, you can go to Facebook and watch again. You can go to YouTube and you can watch again, but hear these scriptures again. Listen to this lesson over again so you can get it into your heart, so you can set it in stone that you have been chosen by God. You have been chosen, and who he chooses, he will in no wise cast them out. If you are saved, you are saved. The problem that people have is they see someone who, who looks saved and sounds saved and acts saved, and they're in church and they're doing, doing saved things, and all of a sudden their life goes haywire, and they're no longer in church, and they're outside of the church doing all sorts of things, carrying on as if they never knew the Lord. And we wonder what has happened. Well, what probably happened, without being a judge of anybody's life, what probably has happened is this individual was never truly saved. Being safe has nothing, being safe is not about how much you, time you spend in church and do all the things that church people do. If you blend in with them, you know, listen, the church is the, is the best place to go and hide. You can do all the things that church people do church people and still come away empty handed not knowing Christ for yourself that's why it's the job of the church as we said at the outset it's the job of the church to preach to preach the cross to preach Christ and him crucified it is the power of God unto salvation or the power of God that leads to salvation the preaching of the cross not anything else the preaching of the cross it must be a major part of what the church does and what the church is about bringing others to Christ amen well amen we want to thank God we thank God once again for the opportunity uh, to come before him uh, once again go to our go to our uh, our website at that's the word dot org and you can also go to our YouTube channel and subscribe to our YouTube channel there uh, you can also uh, you can also go to uh, Spreaker.com and you will find several other podcasts uh, that will also be beneficial and helpful in your Christian life. Teaching, whether it's teaching, whether you want a devotion, whether you're on the go, we have short devotion, we have a little longer devotion. There are sermons, there are teachings on all sorts of subjects. So once again, avail yourself to the resources there at uh, that's the word dot org and Spreaker.com. Avail yourself. Please avail yourself. They are for the taking. Amen. So we thank God once again for this opportunity. Uh, don't forget to share this page with someone if you're on 
Facebook, tell someone about the Cutting It Right Bible Study. Tell them that we are here every Wednesday night at 8.30 and we are here teaching a, a word that we pray will be beneficial to your personal Christian life. Amen. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes. It's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have too. We'll see you next time on the Cutting It Right Wednesday Night Bible Study. May God bless you.